instruction slash college and career readiness. I've been in the district for 20 years, um, very invested. I have a kindergartner that just started at Lincoln Elementary. So our work is really powerful to our entire district. And I want to thank the board and Mr. Hyatt for the privilege of working for Gallup McKinley County Schools and being in a district that's absolutely progressive and forward thinking and allows us to put into action really great ideas that benefits our kids. So thank you for that. And I have Ashley with me to help click and also Mr. Hyatt said we have 15 minutes, but the clock stops every time he speaks. So, we have, so Ashley's going to keep us on, uh, keep us on task. Uh, Mr. Mortensen, when you ask about what our next steps are, I think that was a perfect segue into this. Um, there's three R words up on the PowerPoint, uh, rigor, relevance, and relationships. And those are really key words to our superintendent. And oftentimes, they're thought of in separate measures. So when we think about our tier one instruction and really aligning our curriculum and giving equal and equitable opportunities to learn to all of our students across the district, usually that lens goes to rigor, making sure we're, we're teaching the skills at the grade level. And then we forget about the other two really key ingredients to that success, which is relationships with kids and making their learning relevant. So I think this entire presentation also will help to ask your question as to what are we going to do next to provide better opportunities for our kids and it comes with a college and career readiness education program so this is the second layer to improving our tier one instruction okay so college and career readiness um, we we've done a good job of making sure that we're teaching the right skills to our kids at the right grade level and we're going to continue to work on that but through a college and career readiness program, we can add two more layers, which is building relationships with adults, which you'll see later in the presentation, which has a really, uh, is really impactful on student learning. And then also giving our kids opportunities to explore careers and employability skills at very young ages, which will add relevance to their learning. And those are two things that we don't often really hone in on and be very purposeful about. And so the development of a college and career readiness program is, is the next layer. So most importantly, we need to align it to our strategic plan. So every aspect of the curriculum and instruction department with the help of every single department that's sitting at that table, we've kept that strategic Elevate 2022 plan kind of at the heart of our design and implementation. Um, some of it's a direct and some of a little more indirect, probably goal number two, creating pathways that connect student learning to their career goals and strengthening our community partnerships is really the direct relationship to the Elevate 2022, but hopefully indirectly, we're also increasing student engagement and academic performance and also empowering our team because this is, as you'll see we go through, is not going to be an easy task because it's so multifaceted and it's gonna take our entire community throughout our entire county to really get this system up and running. All right, we could, we could talk for a long time about this, but we'll try not to, because Ashley and I really enjoy data. But when we presented this out to our school leaders, and even in talking with Mr. Hyatt, the why is super important. If you just start dumping initiatives onto people, they're not gonna understand why we're doing it. And so that starts with leadership, with the board, Elevate 2022, down to the district level. Then it's our job to pass it to the leadership and how it's gonna ultimately improve our schools and do better for our kids. So a little bit about the why to college and career readiness is our next step to improving tier one instruction. So pretty traditionally, there's three paths to post-secondary. You have a high school path, a mid-skill path, and a bachelor degree path. And really those three paths determine, are determined by the choices that kids make after they leave school. And we really haven't had much impact on that, and that's the piece that we want to change. Go ahead, Ashley. All right, little brief description, and then I'm going to have Ashley chime in on these graphs. So the high school pathway is really the workers that enter the workforce uh, with, with just a high school diploma. Then you have your middle skills pathway with something that's a little bit more, a certificate in AA degree, some type of um, associates or a business license, maybe like cosmetology, auto tech, something like that. 
then of course you have your, bath, your BA pathway, bachelor's, master's, or a doctoral degree. So the trend data uh, statistically that shows us from the Department of Labor, over the past 30 years, what's happened in these three pathways. So it's kind of three things that we've observed. So the high school pathway has really shrank. So the job market for kiddos leaving high school to enter the mines or the railroad, those types of industries straight out of high school and make a li livable wage has really diminished. On the opposite end of that, we have ex grown our bachelor's and above degrees tremendously almost to the point where we've saturated the market. So we have people leaving college or not even making it all the way through college that can't find viable employment that makes a living wage. Luckily, the good news, because that was kind of bad news, the good news is that middle section and because of technology and the increases in technology over the last 30 years, the middle skill pathway has significantly increased and that's something that as a school district we can really target. So Ashley, I'm gonna let you jump in on that graph really fast. And if I could add really quick, I'll take out of the 15 oh, minutes for a second. <laughs> uh, that middle category, the, the salaries for that middle category have also dramatically changed and you may be hitting that in a minute. Sorry, throwing that in on my well, own. Well, we didn't have a whole bunch of time, but I can touch on that just briefly. Yeah. So, and that's really jumped from that middle skills category to a livable wage between 28,000 and to up to 35,000. So most of the middle skill jobs that are considered middle skill would be 35,000, which is definitely a decent livable wage. Ashley doesn't want to speak. <laughs> okay, so turning this vision into a reality, I mean, we can, we can live in grandiose land of, you know, we have nine high school, we have 35 schools if you include our, our, our early college high school, you know, about wouldn't it be great if. So last year it really came down to we have to put the, the tires to the road and say how do we turn this vision into a reality. So that's kind of our next section. So we know the why, we know it's good for kids, so how do we make this happen? So Mr. Hyatt provided for our department really three kind of overarching goals, uh, which we consider our design stage. So he said uh, for school year 2019-2020, I would like to see two pathways, and I'll get into exactly what a pathway is here in just a minute. I want two pathways in all Gallup-McKinley County high schools with sequenced courses. I also want purposeful adult student relationship time built into the master schedule for every secondary school. And I want a six through 12 employability skills curriculum implemented. Those are really lofty goals that if you want to achieve, you have to get out of hypothetical and really quickly into the hard work. And this is where the departments, the community, uh, the principals, the teachers, and hopefully the students when, they, when, when this is rolled out to them officially are gonna be really excited about it because I think you'll see we far exceeded our goals. And if, if I could add, I actually upped it to three by the end that, and that there, there are new pathways in every single high school. And then this, again, this is the first year of implementation and the goal for the next year was that we'd have 100% of all students involved in pathways at our high school level. Okay, so here's what we have accomplished. And again, we can talk about this for hours. So any other questions or any other time you'd like to talk more about it, we'd be glad to. These are kind of the key accomplishments of what we were able to do in our design and be able to implement coming into this school year. So really starting February, we got down to business and really put things into place. So the curriculum and instruction and assessment department actually built a curriculum framework and scope and sequence for an employability skills curriculum awareness. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but we had a choice. Do we go out and do we find a textbook company to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on to provide for us a curriculum? Or can we build a curriculum around our beliefs of a curriculum and implement it so that it really serves our kids? And that was the option we chose. We have more than two pathways in every single high school. Uh, we've made sure that those are aligned to Carl Perkins. We're utilizing our JOM funds to help us uh, to benefit that, those pathways, and that we have licensures and FTEs at all schools to carry out the pathway. 
We've aligned all of our instructional materials. You can see there some of the examples. We had to go buy child development books and teacher preparation materials to support the teacher education pathway. So that would be an example. Um, we've standardized the pathways. That's really important because we don't want a teacher education pathway in Navajo to look any different than a teacher pathway at Gallup High School. Those pathways are going to be scoped and sequenced identically with the same exact resources. So that was really key. Um, we've also met time and time again with UNM Gallup, who's been super supportive. They've increased their dual credit, their concurrent enrollment, and they also increased our ability to send uh, college and career technical education students up to UNMG by offering us both AM and PM classes. So that you will see those numbers expand. Uh, and then just entering into community partnerships. I listed a few of them up there, um, NTU. Uh, the Greater Gallup Educational Develop, I'm sorry, Economic Development <laughs> Center, the Commerce, uh, we had Marathon uh, Petroleum partner with us and Workforce Solutions. So those are a few of our key accomplishments. Okay, this is again a lot of information, so hopefully everybody's doing okay. So we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into what does a pathway mean, because oftentimes we throw around acronyms and we assume that people that aren't in education know what we're talking about. So let me go into a little deeper what the pathway means and then what pathways are being offered at our various schools. Okay, so, well, which one to do first, the left side? Okay, left side first. So when you're developing a pathway, it's really a three core sequence um, that has to align to the New Mexico PED career cluster guide, which is your overarching clusters. And then from that, you build a sequential three core sequence for students to take that would culminate into some type of a capstone project. So an example would be welding one, welding two, welding three, and then they would go to UNM to the, the auto tech that offers a, offers a certificate in which they're welding cars. So that would be like an example uh, in the construction um, pathway. So the other key point of a pathway is you just can't randomly assign them. You can't just have an art pathway or a music pathway. You have to choose pathways that meet labor demand statistics. So you have to look at your local labor shed, which ours is the North Central, I think, and you have, they have to meet the three criteria of high demand, high growth, and high wage standards. So you have to gear your pathways in order to continue funding for Carl Perkins around meeting those three. So we actually had to go and look at labor statistics and, and where we fall with our job markets in order to determine what pathways we wanted to support. Okay. And then on that right side, and I'm not gonna read you all of those, uh, but those are really the pathway guidelines that the PED sets up to ensure that these pathways are beneficial to students. And I do want to emphasize these pathway classes do not take away from their core instruction. They're still going to have their math, their ELA, their social studies, and their science, nor do they completely replace their electives. So we still have PE, we still have choir, we still have band, we still have those options. These are core sequences that they would take throughout from their ninth through their 12th grade year. So you're really looking at one course each of those years. So they still have plenty of opportunity to have electives. Can I get everything? Okay. Okay. okay, so this is a hard slide to read, but it's super, super important, and I had to try to fit it onto one page. But I really would like you to look at the amazing pathways that our principals and leaders were able to establish at our high schools. So at the very top, those are the feeder schools. So we wanted to kind of put what mid-schools feed into each of those schools, but you'll see Crown Point, Gallup, Mia Mira, Navajo Pine. And notice at the top of many of those is health science. So health science absolutely meets the top three criteria of high demand, high wage, high growth. Some of the others that we could highlight that also meet that are teacher um, education, uh, manufacturing and industry, what are another one? and business management, and also I'd like to note Tohatchi, which was able to support the arts, audiovisual, technology, and communication, which is very up and coming 
with the film industry. So we think that's a really key program that we want to help her build, uh, Ms. Allison, and sustain in Tohatchee. So those, that's kind of an overview of the different career pathways that are available now to all of our kids. So these are implemented, go back for just a second. So when I mean they're implemented, that means this year we are offering either the first course or the first two courses in a sequence in each of these pathways. We have the textbooks, we have the teachers, and we have the students enrolled in the class, and hopefully yesterday they were in their seats. So that's super exciting. Yes. If I could add one piece sure. to this, when, when students are taking this course sequence, that doesn't mean that there is not a level of relevance in all the other core other, other uh, courses that the students take during, throughout the school day or school year. So even though you may be an English teacher, um, the, the goal is to make sure that English, when they're teaching their standards, that they're also creating relevance to whatever those career pathways in the school that their students are involved in. So for example, if, a, if you have a health, health career pathway in your school, then the articles, for example, in a, in a math or in an in a English or social studies class, whatever it might be, the goal is for those teachers also to incorporate health-related types of reading materials, um, other kinds of materials into their lesson development so that students are learning about their pathways, not just in their core sequence of classes, but also in their other core classes. And that's again builds on that need for relevance to tie students in to their instruction and into what they want to do in their life. So. Thank you. And I, we're going to actually highlight that as well on the next page. I want to steal uh, your thunder. That's okay. No, it's a perfect <laughs> segue. Um, so that's where we are with the pathways. Uh, and again, implementation stage. So we're still, you know, we're still sending teachers to training. We're still, I'm doing needs assessment with my principals almost weekly, like what can we get you? Giovanna is finding us amazing sources from which to, to be able to, to supply these teachers what they need to implement these classes. So, but we're up and we're running and it's, it's super exciting. So this next slide is the icing on the cake. So these are, not only did we meet the, the three overarching goals, again, not perfect, but we're, we're up and running. We also had some really amazing um, opportunities that have come out of this work with our community, with the New Mexico PED and Priority Schools Bureau and, and School Turnaround. Uh, the first one I would like to highlight is that Mia Mira next door, because they were a, a CIA, help me Ashley, CSI, CSI school, uh, they were struggling with their graduation rate, so they had the opportunity last year to apply for what's called high school redesign, which the Priority Schools Bureau, in conjunction with John Hopkins, provides a, a pretty significant amount of money to redesign high schools so that they better serve kids. And through that, they've been able to create some more complex pathways, but they're actually also engaging in a school-wide project to build a tiny home and then sell back to the community in order to uh, donate or to generate funds for a, maybe an organization of the student's choice. I don't know if they've got that far with it, but that tiny home will be contributed to by all of the pathway courses. So that's really exciting when Mr. Hyatt said, how are the other, you know, how are we tying this all together? They're gonna, they're gonna build a tiny home in order for students to see you know, how does biomedical tie in? Well, homes have to be equipped for handicapped students. How does the construction tie in or architecture? So that's one way that's uh, super exciting. Now, we have two more schools in application for high school redesign. So through high and Crown Point High, hopefully we're gonna go to their will and capacity interview, will also be selected for that program, which means they will get additional funding to redesign their school. So we have those interviews next week with the state. Yes. Hmm? We also were granted a, um, a gift from Marathon Petroleum in the amount of $75,000 to help build our construction and welding programs. Uh, so we'll have that check presentation. Um, maybe I'll send you all an invite in a couple of weeks. So all of that money don't, was given to our, all of our high schools, with the exception of Miyamira because they were in the uh, high school redesign grant. 
Uh, we have 169 more students attending CCTE classes at UNM Gallup. We are looking to explore a Greater Gallup Economic Development Center Los Alamos Labs partnership. They want to come in and help us get our students opportunities for internships with Los Alamos Labs. Uh, we also, Ashley and I, just submitted a grant to the state for an additional 350,000 to build Project Lead the Way biomedical pathways in five of our high schools. And this is probably one of the most exciting for us is to offer precision exams for all of our pathway courses so that a student can leave that course with an industry certificate. All right. So we're going to kind of go a little quicker through the two-prong approach. We, uh, power of relationships we know is important on top of the employability skills curriculum. So we wanted to build that time for adult student contact purposely into the master schedule and also give them time to work on employability skills. So we're going to just cover briefly what our employability skills curriculum look like and then you all can ask us any questions. I think we're good. Yeah, we're probably good. Okay. Go ahead, one more. All right, employability skills curriculum. So those soft skills, what do we offer our kids so that they can connect to the behaviors that we like to see in school that promote a safe school environment? How can they translate those into the workforce? So that was really the basis for development of our employability skills curriculum, but we utilize the CTE, uh, Carl's Perkins kind of outline for employability skills uh, to, to give our overarching topics for students to explore. Go ahead, Ash. One more. All right, so really the purpose of the curriculum, it's for six through 12, was to provide a framework for principals and teachers of the essential employability skills to be taught by quarter, by grade level. So every single six through 12 school has a chunk of time built in, a minimum of three times a quarter, where they will have adult relationship, student relationship, activities, icebreakers, things like that. They will do grade checks and then there will be a lesson on employability skills so that students can see what types of behaviors they'll need in the workforce that will make them employable. And I don't know if, I'm do if I could add really quickly, sure. as, as you know, when you're talking about employability skills or soft skills, as many people call them, these are skills not only for the workforce that people need to have when they're employed, yep. but it also, it, duplicates itself, obviously there are skills that can be used in the school. And so what we are hoping is not only are they learning these skills, obviously for their future, uh, but it will help foster a better environment uh, for their learning and their communication within the school also. All right, so just briefly, we'll tell you what those, what those topics are and they're scaffolded up into the 12th grade. So the sixth grade you can see are a little more self-awareness, managing time and materials as kids switch from elementary to mid-school where they're switching classes. So we're gonna to try to help them with those skills, um, self-direction, and then interpersonal skills. How do you act and interact with one another? Seventh grade, we get into the critical thinking, technology use, communication and collaboration. Then eighth and ninth grade, we really ratcheted up a couple notches to career awareness. What are your post-secondary options? How do you apply what you've learned in class to the workforce, things like that? And then 10th through 12th grade, students will be in those pathways. And we're also going to take a look at things like personal finance and college and career prep. So how do you fill out the FAFSA if you're headed to college? How do you fill out the FAFSA if you want to go to a community college and obtain an AA? What can you do with your precision exam certificates to put them on a resume if you're ready to enter the workforce the day after graduation? Please show it to them. So that's the helicopter view of our college and career initiative, which is definitely multi-layered. So any questions that you have? Kevin. You? Uh, yes. I'll get us kicked off. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll be after you. So the goal here is to have 100% of our students involved in some kind of college and career pathway. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, this, this is, this really, I can see, you know, I can kind of catch the vision of what you're doing. I mean, this is a long, long, long-term project. 
but it is so it is so important, and I appreciate your efforts with it. Something that I would encourage you to do is to um, work on measurables uh, and results. Sure. And and you know the the only thing I can think of is like you know when I was when I was going to college, there was uh, you know like the the U.S. News and World Report has like their MBA report every year, and they you know they take their top 50 MBA programs and they have it broken down to you know how much it costs what you can expect your salary to be when you graduate uh, how long the average graduate waited before they had a job you know some of these types of things there's got to be some applicable metrics that we can use you know that can help uh, I think it can really help sell this program to a lot of people but then also help us know that we're on the right track. We ultimately want our kids to be successful in whatever they, you know, career or college pathway that they choose. We want them to be successful. And there's got to be something that we can sure. that we can measure measure that by. And and that's a long-term project because you know, you've got to you know, it takes a year or two to get this in there and then you've got to have somebody that's going to gather this data after the kids have scattered after graduation or whatever, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know how you do that, but I'd encourage us to come up with some way to measure that. Mr. Morton, some members of the board, as a part of your strategic plan, um, some of the metrics that we're we're using, uh, that we've already started gathering the data, uh, number of students in a pathway is one of the measures in the Elevate 2022. We've also have. Um, Number of students in employability skills courses, how many have completed that? That's also one of the metrics. And this past few weeks, a lot of parents have gotten phone calls because we have asked high schools, we're actually collecting data on what students are doing within a year out, out of high school. So we're seeing what students are attending college, what students are home with children, or what number of students that are in the workforce. And so we're using some of those measures to gauge um, how effective we're being. And uh, you're, you're right, it's a long-term thing. Cause it's, to, do, to have every student in a pathway is going to take another year, and then to see the fruits of that labor is going to take uh, several years to see where those students end up. And uh, it'd be great to get to the point where we could find out, you know, salary levels. Um, that's that's a touchy subject, hard to ask somebody what they're making in a year. But uh, we're doing the best we can to figure out what metrics we can use, and those are the first ones that we've started with. And then also, just really quick, the precision exams. Um, which are industry aligned exams to most of these, these courses. And they're really geared at students that can get an A or B in these pathway classes. They're issued an industry certificate, but the second side of that is they're willing to come in and meet with our industries that are local and allow them to get in, give input into those, those frameworks and industry um, standards for the different courses. So hopefully we can also track how many certificates you know, our, our students are obtaining as they leave high school and then getting employed. Those certifications and things like that, I mean, those in itself are, are measurable. If, you know, if we're graduating kids that can, you know, pass whatever professional exam or, you know, professional certificate exam on day one, I mean, that's, that's a big deal. And another side, side me metric uh, that we can look at too is, as I mentioned this before, but students who or schools who have their students involved in career pathways have a 15.9% percentage point increase in graduation rates on average across the country. Uh, and that's significant. That is a huge increase for a school to see. Now, when you take into consideration school districts that have implemented career pathways that have a high poverty level, it actually goes above 20% graduation rate increases, percentage point increases. And so that'll be something else we'll watch. Um, sometimes it's not always easy to, to, to correlate the two, uh, but we'll be looking at graduation rates over the next several years. Uh, we, we should see an uptick, uptick if we look at uh, statewide average or, or countrywide averages. Mr. Martinson, and um, I have a couple of questions. I don't know if you want me to answer, give you them one by one and you answer them, or do you want me to give you all of them? Probably one by one. Okay. <laughs> The first question I have is on your on on all of this planning. Um, my one of my concerns is our special needs children. Sure. So is this implemented? Is there also a plan in, implemented for them, um, so we can see them also? Um, I know that we have 
project search project, project search, search. Mm -hmm. um so but i don't see project search anywhere mm -hmm. on 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 this presentation is there so how are you implementing our special needs children so oftentimes our special needs students actually do very very well in these types of classes because they're so hands-on so many of these classes they've already are very much a part of such as welding and auto body um anymore you can it's, it's not it. exclusive yeah. of anybody so any student that's enrolled really in the general population yep. will be a part of the pathways whether mm -hmm. they're a special education student or not uh, it's for all students um, mm -hmm. Yep. But for the more special needs students that you're talking about with Project Search, actually Project Search was one of was actually the first career pathway that was developed in our school district. It's actually a program with mentorship, mm -hmm. uh, where students are a part of uh, a business where they're learning that job skill and then placed mm -hmm. in jobs. And that's what we want to work towards for all those students who are entering the workforce right out of high school. We're actually getting to the point where we have internships and that we're placing students uh, mm -hmm. in, into positions. One of the, I'm sorry, Mr. Hart. Um, one of the complaints that I hear out in my in the different schools I attend is that they want to do this. They they have been trying to do this, but a lot of our schools do not have the funding. They lack funding, especially we have a wood shop and a um, uh, auto body. Yeah, mm -hmm. at at in Theroux. Mm -hmm. but the wood shop nowadays are are all technology mm -hmm. and we still have the hand saws sure. and sure. everything is laser now and but w to implement that costs money sure. so is that where these extra grants and extra mm -hmm. funding yes. will be utilized to purchase mm -hmm. the state-of-the-art um, equipment mm -hmm for our schools. Absolutely. So part of the Marathon Petroleum Grant through high school was given $10,000 uh, to purchase equipment for both of those programs. So, and again, on the needs assessment, I have been asking principals on a continual basis, what is it that you need? Dream big. And our financial, Giovanna has made many of those, those items happen. And I'm just keeping a running list as we apply for more and more grants, you know, as we find additional funds to be able to supply our teachers with absolutely state-of-the-art equipment. And, and if I add one little piece to that is, while we will get all the equipment that we need in order to teach that career pathway and provide that for our students, Industries are also stating that across the country that we don't necessarily want you to teach every single specific skill that they might need in our particular job, in our particular company, but they want you to learn essential skills that are a little bit more broad. And, so if, and then they will train those students or those applicants uh, that receive those positions in the more specific detailed things. Now, auto shop, that might be a little bit different, but... Um, so we're providing all that we can as a school district for those to teach the skills. The more in-depth, really high, high-tech things that students will need, the workforce and the industries are saying, let us train them in that. You just provide them those essential skills to, to enter the workforce. And part of my job is to go out there and make those community connections. A good example is entering into conversations with Los Alamos labs that are not looking for four-year degree people. They are desperate for middle skilled lab technicians and having them come in and talk to our students about if you finish a viable employability skills curriculum and a three course sequence of biomedical, we will take it from there. Right. So. And so part of that too is they'll get training. We want to get to the point where those students are actually in internships with businesses and they'll get some of that extra skill development while they're on the job. The other thing that I was kind of looking at, I know that, um, um, and you probably don't know why, but I just, I just wanted to mention it, like Tohatchie, Tohatchie High School, they, we always hear about their, I think it's eight, nine carports for automotive, but they're not even looking at automotive. And then we hear about Crown Point's welding shop that you know they have a huge welding shop it's not one of their career pathways I, I i would i would think they would be the first ones to pick that but i don't know why it's maybe because it's with the cte sure. course or something sure. i don't know but i was just kind of so let, um, pointed that wanted to point that out um 
The other thing, under your areas that you want to train students, like with resumes and you know different different things that um, how to get ready for uh, college and stuff. I think one of the things that I've seen a lot of our students um, that have come back through the community center is the culture shock that they have when they do go into a university, mm -hmm. um, especially a huge one. Sure. Um, and they don't start off small, they jump right into mm -hmm. a huge university and leaving home. Sure. And I think we got to prepare our kids for that. We are not preparing them to where they're ready for a huge university mm -hmm. and what does it mean to attend a huge university like Yale or you know something to that effect because mm -hmm. we do have kids that qualify to get sure. there but then they last a year and they come back sure. and I think that are maybe working gradually up from a community college mm -hmm. to a university yep. may be an option for some of our students and I, I, I just would like to see that kind of training or lesson or something also brought to our children. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I wanted to mention, or no, not to last, I'm sorry. Um, we need more emphasis on scholarships. And I think now that we've updated our website, maybe start uploading the scholarships that are available to our students that can look at the website and see, I mean, I, parents are trying to research them. Are, like I, I, I have a senior this year. And I'm trying to research them. You know, there's like Coca-Cola and the electric company. But if there's just a direct website that kids can look at on sure. our website sure. that they can link into, um, mm -hmm. would be so beneficial. I know the counselors are busy also doing multiple tasking with school schedules. And I know that's the academic counselor's responsibility too. But um, I think it would just be another benefit for us to have that kind of resource that we can click on and look at. Um, and the last question is um, internships. Mm -hmm. You know, I really appreciate the, what you said about the internships, but we have wonderful companies, wonderful mm -hmm. home companies that would love to take internships in. And even with our own um, Navajo Nation and Zuni or, you know, the colleges around here. And I think we need to start building those relationships and partnerships with so we can have the internships. I know Mr. Mortensen had said at one time he would welcome, even in his business, some internships to help. So just, I think that's very valuable to get the hands-on mm -hmm. because our children are hands-on learners sure. and we, there's only so much we can learn from a book mm -hmm. until you get the hands-on experience. And um, my daughter took um, nursing and she said, nope, that's not for me. And she mm -hmm. went into for, forensic, um, um, investigator mm -hmm. position instead of into nursing. So, you know, they don't know it until they experience it. Absolutely. So, thank you. Thank you. I do want to just clarify real quick. Um, sometimes the headings, the overarching clusters are a bit misleading. So when you see Crown Point um, High School, as far as they do actually have welding one, welding two, and welding three, it's not called a welding pathway. It's called the manufacturing pathway. Oh. And, and why they do that is, is to offer kids kind of like um, architecture and, and construction. You, you don't want to pigeonhole kids. You want to offer them all of the jobs on the spectrum from high school path to middle skill path to BA doctorate path. These are all of the jobs on the spectrum, but we're going to offer you a really great learning experience through welding one, welding two, and welding three in conjunction to your other core classes so that you have a better opportunity to see relevance, which is what Ms. Manuelito just spoke about, and also to explore, maybe you hate welding, maybe you actually find out that cluster means very little to you and you wanna switch over into the health science medical field. So I think that was just an important point. Um, that's how they're headed so that we don't track kids into a certain profession. Thank you. I have one comment. Uh, Ms. Manuelito, members of the board, you asked about emphasis on scholarships for seniors. That's another program that we're implementing or uh, expanded rather. Is there a reader to reader program for seniors? Do you work with them for a semester talking about college applications, beefing up their um, uh, essays for applications, researching scholarships? How do you get a higher score at ACT, those kind of things? So they're working with them 
And then in the second semester, they work primarily with the juniors to say, hey, you have, what are you doing on your SA, ACT? What are your plans? How are you going to get to college? Um, instead of the big giant universities, well, how, start small. What can you do here within the community? Develop plan A, B, and C. So when A doesn't come through, you have plan B. So we do have that um, program available for our seniors and our juniors. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the presentation. It's thoughtful, and I can... Yes. I can tell you guys are locking it out, man. It's a lot of work, Oof. and I appreciate it. Wow. Um, okay, Mr. Hyatt.